because your thesis is that U.S. Treasuries no longer have the dominant position of the global reserve asset for central banks. Now, currently, oh, Luke, yeah. Uh, currently, it's 58%. Uh, uh, the dollar share of global reserves is at 58% as of uh, Q4 of 2023, uh, according to the IMF. Now, we, we just started this interview by saying how China is selling its uh, U.S. treasuries. Uh, but beyond China, what do you see happening with central banks to make the U.S. Treasury bond lose its position as king of the global reserve central bank assets. So, yeah, I think the reason why the U.S. Treasury market is, is losing its share as primary global reserve asset, um, and we can see that since 2014, global central banks have sold $400 billion of treasuries on net, and they've bought $600 billion worth of gold on net. So from a marginal perspective, uh, for the last 10 years, gold has, uh, central banks have bought gold and sold treasuries. The reason I think this is happening is, is, is multiple. Number one, uh, for the reasons I just highlighted, some of it's mechanical. When the dollar gets too strong, you sell what you can to raise dollars, not what you want to, that's treasuries. Um, number two, some of it is geopolitical. Treasuries for central banks are no longer risk-free instruments. If you do something the United States government doesn't like, they will take your treasuries, full stop. They've done it to Russia, they've done it to others, and that has opened eyes. Uh, the third point is a little more um, subtle, but it is in a world where you have peak cheap oil, which is to say we're not running out of oil, but we're running out of cheap oil. It, it costs more and more to find marginal barrels of oil. When we're in a peak cheap copper world, uh, where again, we're not running out of copper, but the copper we find, the prospective supplies are much, much higher and everyone wants to electrify everything. Um, then you can't store the reserves that you're going to need to, at some point as a nation, deploy possibly into oil, into copper, into commodities. You can't store that in bonds. You need to store that in a reserve asset whose value either stays flat or gains versus oil and copper. And gold has a very long history of maintaining or increasing its value in oil, copper, and other commodity terms. For example, in the last 15 years, oil or gold is up roughly 4x, uh, about 3x to 4x versus oil and a, a little over 4x against the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. And in contrast, treasury bonds are certificates of confiscation against commodities in a, uh, in a peak cheap copper, peak cheap oil world. Now, if the US debt load was modest, such that the Fed could credibly say we will raise rates as high as we need to in order to contain inflation and keep treasury bonds as good as gold for oil and for commodities, then we wouldn't be seeing this switch in my view. But the problem is with the debt at 120% to GDP and deficits at 7% with near or full employment, the United States cannot credibly say we're going to raise rates as much as we need to to stop inflation. They can't. The United States government can't afford much over 5 or 6% on the 10-year. We know that. We saw it last fall. So if you've got a bond that can only raise rates so much in a world where the geology of copper and the geology of oil and global growth in the global south suggests that the prices of those things are probably going to go up pretty notably over time, then you, you better store more of your surpluses, more of your central bank FX reserves in a reserve asset, number one, that the Americans can't take, which is gold in your vault, not treasuries, and number two, that preserves your country's purchasing power in oil and copper and, and commodity terms, which is also gold, not treasuries. So gold, therefore, becomes the leading reserve asset for central banks. I mean, we have seen uh, central bank purchases of gold at record levels in the last two years. Uh, according to the World Gold Council, central bank net demand uh, totaled 290 tons in the first quarter of this year. That's the strongest start to any year on record. You're saying that as a reserve asset, gold is going to overtake U.S. Treasuries. Is that correct? Yeah, it has for the last 10 years, and it's really blown out in the last two since we grabbed Russia's or since we seized up Russia's FX reserves. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, that's exactly what's happening, and I think it's going to continue.
Let's go back to this idea of, of the dollar being repriced and not replaced. So repriced according to what? Repriced based on, on the trading partner's currency. The dollar is wildly overvalued if you want to reshore U.S. industrial production. Um, if, if that, and, and the mechanics of that really, right, is, is <laughs> we f consider what would happen if we aggressively rebuilt out our defense industrial base. We would need to run bigger deficits. We're already seeing little symptoms of that with what Biden's doing with, with, with what Trump did. Uh, you run much bigger deficits, but again, the bond market, the US Treasury market is 120% debt to GDP. The United States government cannot abide sustained positive real interest rates without creating this debt spiral we discussed earlier. And so if you want to reshore, you're going to need to have the Fed involved basically capping interest rates one way or another, or Treasury one way or another capping interest rates. Um, and doing that will be negative for the dollar, in my view. Uh, and so mechanically, how it would work out one way or another, in my view. Which brings us to the question then, Luke, what is your outlook for gold then? And I believe you said that, well, the, the timeline for this playing out, I know when we chatted previously, you said by around 2030. Is that correct? I think that's fair. I think the next four years are going to be really something because, again, we've got two presidents. No matter who wins, they're both going to run industrial policy and they both can't run again. So, like, the time to do this is now. And when you look at what is happening with the rate at which U.S. debt and deficits are compounding with the dollar where it is, the fiscal situation is acute in America. Um, and so it, that also suggests, you know, over the next four years, we're going to see a lot of progress on this front. So I do think it's going to be, um, I think the world's going to look very different when the next president comes into office in 2028. So let's go 2030, right? Let's have that as our timeline here. What does that mean for gold prices by then? I think gold is has barely, with even with its 30% move higher since November, call it, uh, has barely begun to reflect a reversion to the mean that if I'm right about it, returning to being the primary reserve asset uh, for much for, for at the global central bank level, it needs to be made orders of magnitude bigger in price. And, and something I've highlighted before for clients has been the uh, market value of U.S. official gold relative to the foreign treasuries, foreign held treasuries outstanding. That's simply market price of gold times 261 million ounces that the U.S. owns as a percentage of foreign held treasury outstanding. And so when we go back through history, what we find is the long term average of that ratio is 40 percent, roughly four zero percent. Uh, in 1989, when the USSR fell, the last time we were in a great power competition or Cold War, or whatever you want to call it, that percentage was 20 percent. Uh, and when we had an honest to goodness dollar crisis like 1979 and 1980, the percentage was 134 percent. Now, that is a gold bubble. That meant that foreign holders of treasuries could have showed up at Treasury or Fed and said, give us our gold and exchanged all of their treasury bonds for gold, and the U.S. still would have had a third of its gold left over. That's a bubble in, in gold. Fast forward to today, this ratio is at 7%. Seven. So gold would need to triple just to get back to the very bottom of, the long, of, of, this, of this range where we were in 1989, the last time we had a great power competition. Gold have to rise roughly 6x just to get back to the long-term 50, 60-year average of where it traded um, in that ratio. And, and if we, like I said, if we had an honest-to-goodness dollar crisis, uh, gold would have to go up 19x to match the price level it was at in 1980 relative to foreign-held treasuries outstanding, which just gives you a sense of exactly how exaggerated the growth in U.S. debt has been and how subdued the price of gold has been uh, since those periods of time.